Um, so it was all about the second day. There were short questions. So uh, the first one was uh, asking if the data processing for the trace distance can be seen as uh, just so say, saying that the um, the trace distance contracts under uh, quantum channels. And yes, this is true. Uh, it's exactly this. Um, and the second question was about an operational interpretation of the various representations of quantum channels. We saw uh, like the Choi operator or the Krauss operators. So the Choi operator has a very clear operational interpretation, right? It's just when you prepare a maximally entangled state and uh, uh, half of it, you send it through the channel and then you get a state. So the Choi the Choi operator is nothing but that. Okay, properly normalized. Okay, for the Krauss operators, it's, uh, let's say, a bit less clear, but let's say, okay, in the case where the Krauss operators are unitary, or scaled unitaries, um, then it's very clear. It's just a mixture of unitaries that you're applying. In the, in the more general case, it's a bit less clear what the operational interpretation is. Okay. Uh, so now let me move on to today's, like, yeah, you have a question, yes, sure. So yeah, I can't hear it very well. Uh, in some sense, yes, you can you can extend your Krauss operators as we saw when we saw the time spring dilation, right? So you can see the Krauss operators as part of this isometry, uh, and so the the Krauss operator is the part that you don't trace out. So yeah, indeed, you can see it a bit in this way. Okay. Um, okay so uh, yeah, maybe I briefly recall what, what we did in the last uh, few lectures. So uh, the, the main thing that we did uh, on the second day, so the first day we did review of, of basics. The second day, we saw uh, uh, a very basic task of uh, state discrimination. And uh, we, we asked, we, we, we considered the question where we have n independent copies of rho and n independent copies of sigma. And we characterized uh, in the regime where you fix one of the, uh, the, the type 1 error to epsilon, to a constant epsilon, and you let n go to infinity, and you look at what is the type 2 error. Okay? You, go, you see how quickly it goes to 0. And we saw it goes to 0 at a rate which is given exactly by this quantum relative entropy. Okay? So this gives an operational interpretation of this quantum relative entropy. And yesterday, we saw a proof of um, the fundamental property of uh, quantum which is uh, data processing, right? Which is the fact that if you apply a quantum channel, it can only decrease, okay? Or it contracts under uh, quantum channels, okay? And we saw a, a full proof of that and its various interpretations. Okay, so today we'll try to apply these insights to the problem that I discussed uh, at the very beginning as one of the motivations is the problem of channel coding, right? <coughs> and so I remind you what, what the problem is, is we have a noisy quantum channel, W. Um, okay, we'll see exactly how, how I model it. And I think there's a problem with the with the mic again, but okay. So can try, but uh, I think I speak sufficiently loud that uh, people can can hear me. But maybe for the recording, it's not optimal. The is yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Maybe I this this. Okay. There's. See anyone in the in the room upstairs? But okay, let me try to continue and then we'll see. So yes, yeah, so I would like to to construct an encoder and a decoder uh, for this quantum channel. And in this lecture, uh, I'll focus on uh, transmitting classical information. Right. So this classical information is going to be modeled as a message that I'll call little s. Okay. That will be just uh, uh, it will have a label between one and capital M. 
and the decoder is supposed to uh, retrieve this message. Okay, and so our objective here is to understand the trade-off between uh, this probability of error, the probability that uh, the recovered message is the same as the uh, message I sent, and uh, the size of the, the number of messages I can transmit. Of course, for example, if m is 1, then this is to do, uh, and so I would like to make m as large as possible uh, while keeping the error probability small. Okay, and so the, the, my objective here is to understand this, the trade-off between these two. And uh, OK, so uh, I'll start with uh, uh, special kind of channels. And this will be actually the, the main focus of today, is uh, the setting where this channel has a classical input, but a quantum. OK, so the input is classical, and then there is some noise that happens, and the output is uh, uh, genuinely quantum. OK, so what is a classical quantum channel? So here, I, I, everything is finite. So um, uh, I, I'll see my channel as just a, <coughs> a list of states, right? So my input set is going to be denoted by the script x. OK, so it's a finite set. And the output Hilbert space is, I will call it b. And so my channel is given by a collection of density operators wx, OK, one for every input. OK, so the special case of a classical channel, in this case, is uh, we sometimes denote it with this conditional probability no notation, where this is the input. And given an input x, the probability of seeing y at, as output is little y. OK, and then a typical example is uh, uh, the binary symmetric channel, where uh, I have some parameter f. And I, uh, so I have uh, as input just a bit, 0, 1. And the output is also a bit. And I flip this bit with probability f. Okay. So this is an example. And um, yeah, just to make it very clear, so uh, we can see this, these classical channels as uh, classical quantum channels by just taking a Hilbert space of dimension, the output, and considering the corresponding density operators, which are um, uh, diagonal in a fixed basis of this Hilbert space I introduced. And the eigenvalues are w of y given x. Okay. Good. So of course, you can go beyond. Uh, so uh, just uh, this is an example to show that uh, not all classical quantum channels are classical channels. If, if w0 and w1 um, uh, don't commute, then uh, we have a, a genuinely classical quantum channel. Uh, OK, so now you, you're not, it's not working now at all. Is it working? OK. Um, OK, so W is a classical quantum channel. I can see it as a special case of a general quantum channel, where uh, I start by measuring in the fixed basis x, and then I prepare the corresponding state Wx. OK, so, uh, um, yes, so if I have that my quantum channel W starts by measuring in a fixed basis and then preparing, uh, conditioned on the outcome, preparing Wx, then uh, this is the same as a classical quantum channel. OK, good. So uh, another thing that we'll be doing uh, in this lecture and, uh, and that we do a lot in information theory is take n independent copies of a given channel. Right? Like we did also for states, we studied rho tensor n and sigma tensor n, uh, the distinguishability or the, how, how well we can distinguish them. We'll do the same for channels as well, is we'll take a setting where I have n independent copies of the channel. What do I mean by this? I mean that the input is the um, Cartesian product of the input set, so the script x to the power n, and the output Hilbert space is the tensor product of the output Hilbert space. And the corresponding for an input x1 to xn, so a tuple of inputs x1 to xn, the output density operator will be the, ten the corresponding tensor product. Okay. Good. OK, so I hope the definition is clear. So now uh, we want to understand how well we can code. OK, so let's introduce some basic definitions. 
Um, so yeah, here I introduce some uh, notation. So uh, I'll label with this uh, bracket M as just uh, labeling the messages, okay? So which are just are uh, distinct labels from one to M, from uh, of size M. So for example, one to M. Okay, so what is a code, right? What is a code for this channel W? So I have to give you an encoder and a decoder. Okay, so what is an encoder? An encoder, the, cla the, the input is classical, right? So it's simple, the encoding is just a classical function in this case. Okay, so it maps my, my set of possible messages to the inputs of the channel. Okay, and what is the decoder? So the, de the, the, the output of the channel is quantum, right? So uh, and it, it's uh, it's uh, so it's uh, the 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 decoder should be a valid quantum operation which maps uh, the quantum a quantum state on the Hilbert space B to the messages from one to M. Okay, so what is that? We saw it's a it's a P of M. Okay, this model by P of M. Um, uh, okay, so that's the definition of a code. For now, I didn't say how good it is. This is just the the definition of what the code is. Okay, so it's useful. Uh, to think uh, of the classical setting, often. So uh, what does so the, in the classical setting the encoder is clear, um, but what how do I interpret these these DSs now? So uh, now in this case uh, we may assume I mean there is no need to to go beyond the diagonal, and um, uh, DS can be seen as a diagonal matrix, okay, with uh, entries DS of Y. Okay, and the way I interpret this uh, number ds of y is the probability of decoding to s if I, when I see uh, y. Okay, so you imagine that my, my decoder is a probabilistic operation. So it takes as input y, and it can toss some coins, and as a function of these coins and y, it outputs uh, an s. Okay, and, uh, and so of course the, the POVM condition ensures that this is a valid probability distribution. Okay. Okay. So now, what are the figures of merit of a code that we will want to look at? So uh, it's the 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 main thing is the error probability. Okay. So what is the probability that it retrieves the 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 message that was intended correctly? And so let's just write that as a function of the encoder and decoder. This is fully defined now. Okay. So I'll denote it as uh, p error probability for an encoding and a decoder uh, is just um, so the average, so I, I'll, I'll choose to look at just the average error. So I take the average over all possible messages okay, of the probability that when I send S, okay, so when I send S, what happens? So I, I get, it gets encoded to E of S, and then the output of the channel is this, uh, sta this quantum state, W E of S, and then I see what is the probability that the output of my decoding operation is exactly S, and this is nothing but the trace of the POVM element corresponding to S times this operator. Okay, so this is the success probability. So if I want to talk about the error probability, I just do one minus that. Okay, so I hope this is clear. Um, okay, uh, also a piece of notation. I'll often, uh, instead of just writing the error probability of ED is less than epsilon, I just say it's an M epsilon code. Uh, okay, so you might be wondering about something here is why did I take the average over all uh, messages? I might uh, want that uh, to get a small error for all messages, not just for, for on average. Okay? Um, and so uh, indeed, this is a very valid uh, uh, thing is that you can, you can want the, the maximum error probability that I want for all messages that the sender tries to send, the error probability should be bounded by epsilon. Okay. Uh, so this is what I call uh, p error max, and it has this uh, expression. And so uh, the reason that we look at the average is that it's much simpler to analyze. Okay. And also that it's very easy to get from uh, the average error probability to the maximum error probability. And this is uh, an exercise, simple exercise in your uh, problem session. Okay. So yeah, from now on, again, in this lecture, I'll focus on this average error probability. Okay, so here I put just some basic examples so that you get used to the, to the notation. 
uh, yeah, so let's take the most trivial thing, okay, which is the, the, the a channel which does nothing, okay? So imagine the noisy channel does nothing, right? So it, it takes as input x and it outputs uh, x, okay? Uh, so what would this be in this notation that I introduced? It would just be that uh, the density operator wx is just the projector onto uh, uh, state x, uh, okay, and then in this case there is a very trivial code which you can, uh, which has zero error, okay, and which can send the number of messages which is given by uh, the the size of my set, right? Where uh, I um, uh, encode e of s to ah sorry this shouldn't be um, because the the input is classical, so I should have said just s. Um, okay. Uh, and uh, the decoding, uh, P of EM, DS is just I project onto S. Okay, and it's very easy to check in this case that the probability of error or the probability of success here is equal to 1. Okay. Good, okay, so that was uh, one end like a perfect channel. The other end is a completely trivial channel where I completely cut the link between the input and the output. Um, Right, so there, uh, imagine that for every x, uh, the output density operator is just a fixed state row. Okay, so this means that the input is completely independent of the output. This is a completely useless channel, and so we don't expect the error probability. To, we expect the error probability to be quite high, and uh, let's just see that with with the math. Uh, so uh, we have that um, uh, if I take yeah, so this is the output of the channel. If I take the sum over all S is in M of the trace uh, ds row, I, give, I get 1. And so the error probability, if you plug this back into the, the, the error probability expression, you get it's just 1 minus 1 over M. Okay, Because we're doing things on average, so you can be correct on one of the messages, but you'll be wrong on all the others. OK, good. So, uh, OK, so now that I think hopefully the problem is clear, my objective is to understand the following. Um, so remember, we want to understand the trade-off in this notation between epsilon and m, right? So now I fix epsilon, so this is my allowable error probability. And uh, now the question is, what is the largest m or the largest number of bits I can, I can transmit such that there is an m epsilon code for the channel w? Okay, so yeah, if we want to, to put a, a name to this, I can call it m opt of a channel w with an error epsilon. This is the maximum over all uh, m um, for which there exists an m epsilon code for this channel. OK, and my objective here, and the objective uh, of, of Shannon's theorem that we'll see, is to characterize uh, this, uh, this, exp this, this quantity, m opt of w epsilon, uh, as a function of some simple, relatively simple, entropic properties of w. Okay, and so the important special case where, where um, uh, Shannon formulated his, his famous theorem that characterizes this, uh, this trade-off is uh, the following special case. Okay, I don't look at a completely general channel which can have an arbitrary structure. I look at channels of a specific form right, that are of this form, that are of the form uh, some basic channel. Think of it as a small channel, for example, from a bit to a bit. And I take n tensor powers of it. So I, uh, for example, consider the binary symmetric channel, and I take n independent copies of it, and I think of n as very large. Okay, we'll take the limit as n goes to infinity, and I fix epsilon to be a small constant. Okay. Okay, like in the in the like in the Stein setting, right? That we looked at, we looked at a, a small, uh, a fixed small uh, type one error probability, and we look uh, at the setting where n goes to infinity. And so my objective is the following. The following quantity is I want to look at what is the maximum number of messages, or I look at it in terms of bits, so I take the log of that, the log of uh, m opt. Okay? And it makes sense to look at this, to normalize this, uh, by the number of channel uses. Of course, because the, the, the more channel uses I have, the more um, different bits I will be able to send. So it makes sense to look at this per channel use. Okay, so we divide by n, and we take the limit as n goes to infinity. <coughs> um, 
Okay, and also uh, we'll, we'll take, at least in this lecture, we'll take uh, epsilon going to zero as well. But after n, right? This is important. This order of limits is important. Okay, so uh, okay, so this is what we want to, to, to characterize. We want to try to characterize this limit. Does it have a, a simple expression? And as we'll see, so quite amazingly, it, it, is, it has a quite simple expression, at least in this classical quantum case. Um, okay, so let's think uh, before getting into the, the actual quantities, uh, quantifying this, what, what is the intuition of what uh, should characterize this m opt? Right? So, I mean, wh when is a channel good at transmitting information? Right, so wh when is it good? It's when uh, we want to say that there is a good correlation between the input and the output. Right? It doesn't matter if it uh, if it uh, renames it or, or something like this, but the important is that there is a good amount of correlation between the input and the output. The specific names of the outputs don't matter, but the it's it's the correlations between the input and the output. <coughs> okay, so. Um, Okay, so in order to quantify this correlation between the input and the output, uh, it will be useful to introduce uh, a joint state on the input of the channel as well as the output. Okay? And we'll look at this joint bipartite state and look at correlation measures for, for, uh, for that. Uh, okay, so, so remember that the input is classical, x, and the output is quantum, b, and so I'll define uh, a classical quantum state so uh, for a fixed, uh, for when, when, when the input is x, then it's natural that the output will be w of x, will be the, the output of the channel on the input x. OK, but we have some uh, degree of freedom we can choose here, is what is the probability I will choose on the inputs of the channel. OK, and so this we will see, this is a parameter that will, that will come back and we'll optimize over it in, in all the different expressions uh, we consider. And so, yes, so for now, think of having a, a probability distribution on the inputs of the channel. And uh, depending on this probability distribution, I define a joint state rho on x and b. Okay. okay, so here I just recall this definition of uh, partial traces. So especially rho b will come. So if I take the average. And so, okay, now I want to characterize uh, this, uh, this, this quantity, m opt. And uh, for that, as usual, as we did for, for, uh, uh, for Stein's lemma, we'll have to show two parts, like the converse part, the no-go part, and the achievability part. Um, okay, and so, yeah, just to, to give the structure, so what we'll do uh, first is that we'll, we'll handle the one-shot setting, the, the completely general channel, right? So, I take a completely general channel W, which is not necessarily has an IID structure. And uh, you'll see that uh, this M opt is very related to a hypothesis testing question. And this is why I introduced Schein's lemma. Uh, uh, and so, yeah, this M opt is, is very related to some hypothesis testing question. Um, and so we'll give upper bounds and lower bounds, which relate this M opt to uh, hypothesis testing. Okay, maybe I can ask you a question here. So, do you, you think so? Hypothesis testing is between two states. At least the, the version that I introduce is uh, for sign lemma is between two states, right? Uh, so, you have a guess on what are the two states that will be uh, relevant uh, to distinguish between uh, for this problem. Right? So, I, I claim that um, the channel coding will be related to hypothesis testing between two states. Okay, that of course depend on the channel. What do you think these two states will be? Exactly, right. Yeah, thanks. So it's, it's the, the joint state and the product of the marginals. Okay, but what is, what is the precise quantity? Uh, yeah, and, and we'll see it's, it's related to the hypothesis testing relative entropy between these two quantities. Okay, so here's the theorem. Um, okay, so we'll start with the converse, right? So remember? And the convergence means that if there is a code, so if there is a, an m epsilon code for a channel w, 
then uh, I can construct, then or, or, or then let's say the, the number of messages uh, or the number of bits that uh, this code can encode is uh, upper bounded by some quantity. And this quantity will depend on uh, how well I can make the type 2 error for uh, distinguishing between the two states rho xb and rho x tensor rho b. Okay. Okay, and so uh, as I discussed, so remember this rho xb is not only dependent on the channel, it also depends on the probability distribution that uh, I choose on the inputs. Um, and so for this reason, I take a supremum over all uh, the possible input distributions on uh, for the channel. Okay, so recall that uh, d epsilon h, what is it? So it's, uh, so I want to distinguish between rho xb and rho x tensor rho b. Okay, so I have, remember, recall I have two types of errors. Okay, I have type 1 error and type 2 error. So I fix the type 1 error to be at most epsilon, and I look at uh, what is the minimum type 2 error that I can achieve. Okay, and uh, dh is minus log of this probability of error, so it's, it's, uh, you should see it as a big number. <coughs> okay, and you can interpret this in terms of bits. <coughs> okay, so uh, just a, a comment here I wanted to make is that, so notice that here we're in the, what is called sometimes the one-shot setting, where the channel W is completely arbitrary. Okay, so it's natural to relate, uh, the, to, like to characterize how, how, how well we can do it in terms of uh, what I called one-shot entropies, right? Uh, and not the usual von Neumann entropies uh, that you might be more used to. Okay, and we'll see, and this, this should be now natural, is that now when we take W of a specific kind, when we take W to be IID, this, um, this one-shot entropy will converge to uh, a relative entropy. This one-shot re one relative entropy will, com will uh, converge to the usual quantum relative entropy. <coughs> okay, so let's, uh, let's prove this. Um, it's uh, just an application of the definitions. So, okay, so it's a no-go. So we start with, a, with an M epsilon code, ED. Okay. And then from that, I want to construct um, a distinguisher between rho XB and uh, rho X tensor rho B. Okay, so uh, I'll define the following, uh, like uh, C, okay? It, it will be a set of inputs. It's sometimes called the code as well. Uh, it's just a set of inputs uh, such that uh, there is a message that gets encoded to this input. Okay. Um, okay, and I'll define some probability distribution on X, uh, on, on, the, on, the, on script X, which is just uniform on this set C. Okay, so notice one thing is that the size of C is at most M. Right? And typically, it will be of size m. Uh, but it could be slightly smaller if I choose my encoding. This would be a strange kind of encoding where I, pay, I, I map two messages to the same input of the channel. Okay, this is a very bad idea, because then, of course, you will not be able to distinguish them. But uh, uh, I mean, here, we're, we're doing the general setting, so it, it could happen. This is allowed by the definition. OK. Good. So uh, okay. So I'll 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 define states now. Uh, so now my if for for this definition of of p x I have a rho x b which is one over the size of c times the sum over x's in my code of x tensor w x. And uh, what I'll do is that I'll use the decoding for this code to give you a distinguisher between rho x b and rho x tensor rho b. Okay. So yeah, so th this is rho now. And I want to construct uh, an, uh, a POVM, right? So f and identity minus f, which um, and f will tell me I'm rho x b, and identity minus f will tell me I am uh, rho x tensor rho b. 
So, uh, so how do I construct this f? So it's uh, quite natural, and so, but here's the definition. So I take the sum over all possible x's in the code of x tensor um, on, on, the, on the b side. I sum over, the, over all the s's that map s to x. Okay, so all the messages that are consistent with x, um, uh, I, I sum all of these. Okay, and so now, um, uh, yes, so because ds is a P of M, then f is a valid uh, uh, operator between zero and identity. Okay, so now I have to check, I have to compute the two types of errors, uh, right? So I, I, will, I will compute the, the type one success probability. So if I compute trace of f times rho xb, um, and I just expand this, uh, you find that uh, I get, um, because I, I, I forced e of s to be equal to x, okay, so I, I, uh, I, this, this expression simplifies to just the average over all s's of trace of ds times w of e of s. And if you recall, this is exactly the success probability of the code. Okay, and this is by, by definition of the code, this is 1 minus epsilon. Okay, because we started with an epsilon, uh, with an epsilon m code. Okay. Okay, so the, the, the type one uh, error probability is good. Okay, so at least this, this epsilon part is, is good. Now I have to show the relation between M and the type two error probability. Okay, so now uh, let's look at, now this is really the type two error probability. Uh, it's trace of F times rho X tensor rho B. Okay, I just wrote down the definition of F here. Uh, it's this. And uh, rho x tends to rho b. Remember, rho x is just uh, the average over all uh, elements in the code. And rho b is the marginal. OK, and so of course here, um, uh, the x on this part should be the same as the x on this part. Uh, so I can get the sum over all the x's outside. And then what remains is this, right? So is the trace over all, over the sum over all x's in C of the sum over all s's such that E of s is equal to x of ds times not rho x now, but rho b, the average rho. Okay? So this is a state rho which is completely independent of x. Right? And so now I use the fact that uh, ds is a P of m, so this thing is equal to identity. Okay? And so uh, now I have just a trace of, of uh, rho b, which is 1. Okay, so the, the crucial difference between, um, between the two uh, terms here and here is that uh, in one case I have uh, w x, right? And in this case I have the, the average one. Okay, so uh, that's why in this case it's just equal to 1 over m. Okay, so again, the type 2 error probability is 1 over m, and so um, by definition of, uh, sorry, uh, by definition of, <coughs> of my hypothesis testing relative entropy, uh, it is at least uh, minus log of the, of the error probability, which is just log m here. Okay. And so, of course, okay, so... Here, uh, what I did is I constructed uh, a px such that log m is, uh, is at most uh, d epsilon for this px, but then if I take the supremum over all px, it's even larger, so um, it's clear that I have this inequality. Okay, is this converse clear? Good, okay, so now uh, we, that we have shown the converse and how it's tightly related to the hypothesis testing, might ask, but okay, are we losing by going to hypothesis testing? Or does hypothesis testing between rho xb and rho x tensor rho b uh, 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 characterize in some sense the, this m opt? And so here we'll see that uh, it is basically the case up to some small uh, error parameters. Okay, and so here is the here is the achievability statement. Okay, so um, 
uh, I have I fix an epsilon, so this this epsilon will be the the m epsilon the epsilon for the m epsilon code I would like to construct. Okay, so ideally, I mean, if if it was if things were exactly tight, then I would have that for any m that satisfies that m is not too large, without this delta and without this parameter. Uh, then this would show that the previous result is exactly tight. Okay, so it's not. Here it's not exactly tight, right? You lose a little bit um, in the sense that there is this uh, tunable parameter delta, okay, which uh, we lose a little bit here. And, uh, uh, okay, so you can say, why don't I pick delta equals to zero? Um, but if you pick delta equal to zero, then this term blows up, okay? So it's, uh, it's a trade off between the error probability and the number of messages, okay? So, um, so it's not exactly tight, but uh, approximately tight. Uh, okay. But we'll see that, uh, for example, on the IID setting, then uh, these won't matter. They will, they will go to zero, and so this characterization won't be tight. Okay, good. So let me um, go over the proof of this, if the statement is clear. Okay, so now I should do the opposite. I should say that given that I have a good tester between row XB and row X tensor row B, uh, I can construct a code. <coughs> Actually, okay. So, yeah, so this is what I just said. Um, okay, I can, I can say this from the beginning now is that uh, I'm not sure how many of you have seen already the proof of Shannon's theorem, um, but uh, so as you'll see, uh, uh, the proof will not be explicit. So I'm supposed, right, this is an achievability result, so I'm supposed to construct an, uh, an encoder and a decoder. And so, uh, uh, I mean, as you'll see uh, in a minute, this is uh, um, one of the very nice applications of the so-called probabilistic method, where you choose the object that you're interested in um, in creating at random according to some well-chosen distribution, and then you analyze, for example, the expectation of some of the quantities you would like to, to, uh, to show to bound, okay? And you show that in expectation small, so it means there isn't such an object. Okay, and so this is, uh, so this is just to say that the construction will not be explicit, okay? So it will be randomized, and it says that there exists such a construction. Okay, good. So uh, what is this uh, construction? So let's, uh, so, okay, so for now, so as I told you, E will be chosen at random later. But what I will start by doing is I will uh, start by constructing the decoder as a function of this encoder. So suppose someone gives me this, this encoder and I will give you a generic construction for um, a decoder. Okay, and here we'll use a, uh, uh, a well-known construction that uh, actually was, was also uh, used in, um, uh, I think in the first day in the learning theory course, um, is the uh, pretty good measurement. Right. Okay, and so uh, remember, what, what, what is this pretty good measurement? So imagine that I have um, uh, a set of different states, right? Here, the different states I would like to distinguish are is W, for E of S, right? So I have uh, an encoder which maps my messages to E of S, and then after I apply the channel, I get uh, W of E of S. Okay, and I want to distinguish between these the set of M density operators. Okay, so uh, um, one uh, good choice of measurement is this pretty good measurement is to say that I'll take um, uh, the, the P of M element corresponding to S, I mean, I would like it to put weight on W E of S, and then, uh, but then I have to renormalize it, of course, so that it's a, it's a valid P of M. So I renormalize it by just the sum of, of these uh, operators, right? So, so I want to distinguish between these various operators. And so um, uh, I, I write the s their sum, and uh, if I divide W E of S by the sum, uh, then I get something which I get a, s a set of operators which map to the identity. Okay, and he here what I mean by divide is I sandwich it with lambda to the minus a half. Okay, so these are valid positive operators and it's obvious that the sum to the identity. Um, 
Okay, so perhaps it's useful to see what is the interpretation of this strategy, of this uh, pretty good measurement, uh, in the classical setting. Because this also makes sense, right, in the classical setting. Um, also in the classical setting, imagine I have a bunch of distributions and I want to discriminate between them. Uh, what, is, uh, what strategies can I use? And so what is the interpretation of this pretty good measurement? It, it has a very simple interpretation. It's just saying that um, I... Uh, okay, so I, take, I, get as, uh, I get as input y, right? So y is a sample from one of these probability distributions, and I, and I would like to know which one, right? OK, so that what, what this pretty good measurement is doing is it's saying that I will output S with a probability that is, uh, it's, it's a randomized strategy, right? So it's not deterministic. So depending on Y, I'll output an S. I will toss some coins. And depending on these coins, I will output an S. And I will output S with a, with, with a probability that is proportional to W E of that particular S applied on Y. OK, so. Uh, or in other words, it's uh, with probably W E of S of Y divided by the sum over all possible S's. Okay. There's a prime here. <coughs> okay, so, um, <coughs> so yeah, so the, the, the more standard way of discriminating, which is, uh, which is used and sometimes called maximum likelihood, is to say that on sample y, instead of outputting s with the probability that is proportional to uh, what would to the probability I would see y if the input was s, uh, I instead just output the s that maximizes this probability. Okay, so this now would be a deterministic strategy, um, uh, uh, but uh, this is usually harder to analyze. Okay, whereas this is a bit simpler to analyze, so we'll, we'll focus on this. <coughs> okay, so now given that I have an encoder, a fixed encoder, um, and a decoder, let's just rewrite what is the, the probability of success or the probability of error. So, uh, yes, so the probability of error is uh, here. Again, the average over all S's of the probability uh, of uh, outputting S prime. Okay, so the probability of outputting S prime is just ds prime of we of S. Okay, so and now let's write the definition of ds prime. Um, okay, ds prime is just w e of s prime divided by uh, the sum over all the the w e of s's. Okay, and then of course I sum over all s prime different from s. Okay, and so I notice that I wrote the lambda in a particular way here, where I uh, I, I wrote it as w of e of s plus the sum over all s primes different from s. Um, okay, so how do we analyze this expression? Uh, so let's imagine for now that these are scalars. Okay, how can we easily bound this expression? Um, so yeah, note that for scalars, if I have uh, non-negative scalars uh, A and B, I have uh, I have A times B. So imagine this is A and this is B. So I have A times B divided by A plus B. Okay, so this is simple to see that this is, uh, at most, the minimum of A and B. Okay, and so, okay, but now these are operators. Uh, so I would like an analog of this minimum. So I'd like a minimum of positive operators, a non-commutative minimum. Okay, so uh, one way to define the non-commutative minimum is, is in this way. Okay, so here is, here is this definition. So uh, the minimum of two positive operators A and B, okay, this is definition, okay? So it's just one half A plus B minus the absolute value of A minus B. Um, okay, so it has a few nice properties of uh, what you would expect of a minimum. So in particular, it has this interpretation that if you take the trace of A uh, minimum B, uh, or, or if you want that this A minimum B achieves the following, which you would like, is that if you take any operator M, Hermitian operator, not necessarily positive, um, uh, that is smaller than A and smaller than B, okay? Uh, of course, there's many such operators, uh, but you want to take the best one, right? So the, the one which maximizes the trace. Okay. 
And uh, so it turns out that this operator uh, optimizes this, so satisfies this. It's, it's the one which satisfies this property, and it uh, achieves the maximum trace. Okay, so this is a semi-definite program. You can write it to dual also, which is, is useful. Uh, we'll, we'll use this even. Uh, it's the minimum uh, for all positive operators between zero and identity of trace of A identity minus lambda plus trace B lambda. Okay, so this is very related, if you will see, to, to the operational interpretation for the trace distance that you have done in the exercise session, I think in the second day. Um, yeah, because you see that the, the, the trace distance is nothing but half trace of this quantity, right? So uh, it's normal that these things are very related. Okay, so um, what other properties will we need? Uh, so we'll need this property, right? This is what we, uh, we wanted here for scalars. Uh, we want this to hold also for this operator minimum, and it, and it does hold, right? So if I take trace of A times B divided by A plus B, and remember the, the definition of dividing is just sandwiching by the inverses, uh, the square of the inverses, uh, this is at most the trace of the minimum of A and B. Okay. And uh, also another thing that we'll use is that this quantity is concave. Okay. And this, uh, now that we discussed yesterday, you should see obviously from this expression, because it's a, it's a minimum of uh, linear functions that it's concave from this. Okay, so this is easy. This thing is a little bit harder to prove. Um, but uh, so I refer you to this paper uh, for if you want uh, more pro if you want the proofs of these things and further properties uh, and how it's used in, in information theory. Okay, good. So now, um, okay. So now let's let's continue. So now, okay. So what have we done so far? So uh, if I now bound this uh, AB divided by A plus B by um, uh, the minimum of A and B, I, this is the expression I get. I get that the error probability for the specific, uh, for a specific encoder E and for the pretty good measurement corresponding to E is given by this. So the average of the trace of the minimum operator between, uh, uh, between W E of S and the sum over all W E of S primes. Okay, for S prime different from S. Okay, so now this is a relatively simple expression as a function of E. Let's now plug in an E now and, and analyze this expression. Okay, so as I uh, announced before, the way we'll choose E is that we'll choose it at random. Okay, so we'll choose for different S's, uh, we'll choose E of S uh, independently and randomly, but according to which distribution? So the natural thing is we have a distribution Px which optimizes this uh, expression, right? So uh, if you remember this expression, right? So I take a Px for which this is the largest. Okay. okay, good. So now E is defined, and my, my encoder is defined. And so uh, as is usual in the probabilistic method, what we'll do is will analyze the expectation of the probability of error. Okay, the expectation here over the randomness in this encoding. Okay, so what I need to do is, is the following, is to um, analyze, right? So you see here that for different S's, this quantity is, is distributed in exactly the same way, right? So I, I don't need to, so it suffices to focus on S equals one. And so you see, this is the reason, just a comment, this is the reason we look at the average, right? So if we had a maximum here, this would be an expectation of a maximum, it would be more difficult to analyze. Whereas with, with an average, it's, uh, it's obvious. Sure. Uh, so, um, okay, so E of S, think of E of S as a table, right? So for every... Uh, S from 1 to M, I have to give you an, an element in script X. Okay? So uh, what I do is I just take capital M independent samples from uh, the distribution PX. Okay? And so the first uh, output is E of 1. The second output, which is independent, is E of 2. 
and then E of 3 is, an, is a third independent uh, choice, etc. Is that clear? Okay, so, um, okay, good. So now I'm at uh, this stage here. And so I will choose uh, E of 1, so the, the, the first element uh, at random, Px, and the remaining elements also at random independently. Okay, so I wrote this explicitly um, because we'll use it in the next step. Okay, uh, so now what do I do? Uh, I will use the concavity, right, in the second argument uh, of this, uh, the trace of this operator minimum, okay, to put this expectation over these operators uh, to uh, inside the trace of the, of the uh, in inside the trace of the minimum. Okay, so uh, now let's look at what is this quantity. So this again, right, it doesn't depend on S prime, right? So it's the same for every S prime. And the expectation of E of S prime of W E of S prime is nothing but uh, rho B, right? So uh, for, okay, so I, I didn't redefine rho XB, but rho XB is, I have, I define the P of X, right? P of X is the one that optimizes uh, this, uh, this expression. So if I have a P of X and I have the channel, I have rho XB, which is defined automatically. Okay, so when I talk of, of rho XB and rho B, I mean this uh, specific one. Okay, and so here, what, what is uh, the expectation over uh, S prime accord chosen according to PX of WE of S prime? It's just the average uh, over X of P of X times WX. Okay, and this is nothing but rho B. And this is the case for every S prime. Okay, so I have uh, M minus 1 here because I have, uh, here I have a sum for S prime except 1. Okay, so I have M, M minus 1 of them. And so I, ha I just multiply M minus 1 by rho B. Okay. Okay, and uh, okay, for the other part, I just uh, renamed uh, E1 to just X. So that I have an expression which doesn't involve E. Okay, and so now actually we're done, right? So I just have to, um, uh, so I just put in uh, this extra system X here um, uh, so that I, I write the expression in this way, right? So of course the, the, the so here I just add rho X and here I, I put rho X B and so this expression is, is the same. Okay. So. Good. Okay, so um, yeah, so the, the, the nice thing here is that I, I don't have the encoder and decoder anymore. So it's an expression which only depends on my probability and the channel. Okay, so this is the error probability. And now I would like to, to relate this. Remember, our objective was to relate this to hypothesis testing. Uh, okay, so how will I do this? So I will use uh, one of the two expressions, this uh, SDP expressions I had, um, uh, w which says that this, this uh, trace of the operator minimum is given by this infimum over lambda of trace of identity minus lambda rho xb plus um, the trace of lambda times the second operator. Okay, which is m minus one times this, but now this expression is linear in, in m minus one, so I can put out the m minus 1. It's not here, right? Here it's not, I cannot pull out the m minus 1 here, but, but here I can. Yeah. Uh, good. And so now you see this is exactly uh, uh, hypothesis testing setup, right? So this is the, the, the lambda, this is the lambda which distinguishing is between my two setups, um, my two states, and this is the type 1 error probability, and this is the type 2 error probability. Okay, and so um, uh, by now by definition of this hypothesis testing relative entropy, I have an operator F, a distinguisher, uh, which is uh, by, by definition in between zero and identity, such that the type one success probability is one minus epsilon plus delta, and the type two success probability is two to the minus this relative entropy, hypothesis testing relative entropy. 
And so as a result, right, by plugging in this f here, right, so this expression is at most the same expression if I just plug in f uh, instead of lambda. And so the first term here is just epsilon minus delta, okay, because it's trace of identity minus f times rho xd. And the second term is m minus 1 times the type 2 error probability, which is exactly this. Okay. Good. Okay, so, so uh, and that's it. We're now done, actually, because uh, if I choose m that is according, remember, I chose m basically so that uh, uh, m was smaller than roughly delta times this quantity here. Okay. So globally, this thing is smaller than delta, and so the expectation of the error probability is less than epsilon. OK, so again, to recall, what I did is I chose uh, 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 E, the, my uh, encoder, at random. And I computed on in expectation over this choice of randomness uh, what is the error probability for that code, okay? when I chose the decoder to be the pretty good measurement. Okay, and in expectation, this is less than epsilon. So it means that there must exist a code, uh, E and D, that has a probability which is more than the expectation. And so I'm now done. Okay? And so again, the statement was of the form, just I recall the statement, that if M satisfies this, if M is not too large, okay, so if I take M to be roughly this quantity, okay, maybe I should do minus 1 so that I'm sure that it's an integer, um, then I have an M epsilon code. Okay, so if I take the floor of this, then I get an M epsilon code. Okay, good. Okay, so I'm going a bit slower than what I expected. So, um, oh yeah, yeah, it's uh, actually for the exercise session, it's crucial that I do this. So, um, okay, so we, we have now a characterization of this uh, log of the, uh, optimal number of messages uh, in, in general. Um, so now we want to say that for some specific cases, can we characterize it uh, uh, in, a, in a nicer way, let's say. So for now very large channels, can I, can I find uh, an expression which is nice? So and, and in particular, the, the important example that we consider is these uh, product channels, W tensor N. Okay, so for that, as I said before, we'll define the classical capacity. So the capacity of a, of a channel W is defined as follows. So I take the limit as n goes to infinity of log of the number of messages, and then I take the limit as epsilon goes to zero. Okay, again, this you should interpret as the optimal rate for transmitting information um, uh, over uh, the channel W. Okay, good. So, okay, so one thing which is uh, easy to do given the previous, uh, the, the one-shot expression. So we just, in principle, have to take the previous expression and plug in uh, the channel of the form W tensor N. Okay? So, uh, and, okay, this is what I do here, but, okay, so, uh, so yeah, if, if you do this and look at the previous expression, what you'll get is, is, is uh, an expression of this form. So you'll get uh, hypothesis testing entropy uh, with the relevant states. Okay, as uh, upper bounds and lower bounds for the optimal success probability. Okay, and then if you take um, uh, n going to infinity and then epsilon going to infinity, then you can write an expression for the capacity. Okay, but this expression is a little bit ugly, right? It has all these limits. How do we compute it? Okay, so uh, I claim that. Uh, uh, okay, so here I claim that we have a, uh, a lower bound and an upper bound. So the lower bound is relatively nice, uh, but the upper bound has a limit for now. And uh, so, uh, yeah, given that we're out of time, I will uh, skip this part. But as you can expect, uh, we'll use, at least in the lower bound, we'll use Stein's lemma to relate this hypothesis testing entropy to the usual quantum relative entropy. And remember that the quantum relative entropy between a state and the product of its marginals is nothing but the mutual information uh, between uh, the two parts of the state. Okay. So, okay, let me skip that for now. And let me skip that as well. And um, 
let me just state this theorem, and maybe actually tomorrow I will, I will go over the proof, because I think for those who haven't sh seen Shannon's theorem before, it's useful to, to see it at least once. So, um, uh, okay, so, so the, the statement that, uh, that uh, we'll finish the proof of tomorrow is the following, is that if you take a classical quantum channel, then this capacity, which I, I define as the limit of the optimal number of, of messages, is given by this simple expression. It's just the supremum over all input distributions of the mutual information between the input and the output. Okay? Um, and evaluate it for the usual state, rho. And so, uh, yeah, and I, I wanted to, to cover this because in the, in the problem session, you will, I ask you to compute this capacity for several channels. So that you see the Okay, so I'll stop here for today. Thank you.